as much as I love the music, I'm going to turn it off for now. Um, so I can hear myself talk. Um, okay, cool. So in today's session, we are specifically going to be uh, talking about combos. Um, and combos in a broader sense than what you would think of as just combos. Like you think of combo as like, I do this move, then I do the next move, uh, which of course we are going to cover. Um, but it's more so this concept of conditional probability of doing an action based on the current action, right? That's essentially what combos are, where, for example, if you just did an uppercut and then you want to turn that into a flip kick, um, you want to make sure that basically when you do an uppercut, so it would be up plus this punch, it increases the probability of flip kick, right? Because the AI will have known that you're in the uppercut state right now and to do that. Uh, now, this extends into something else that people have been asking about a lot, which is how to properly use the shield. Okay? Now, um, one thing to note about the shield is that the shield is one of those actions where you actually have to hold the button. Uh, and what that means is that the AI has to understand that it's currently in the shield state. And when it's in the shield state, increase the probability of holding shield even more. Right, so for example, let's say you are here, and let's say you want there to be a 50% probability of pressing shield when the opponent is right next to you and they're facing you because you think they're about to punch. Now, once you go into the shield state, you don't want there still to be a 50% probability. You want this to be very high, maybe like 90, 95% probability. And the reason for that is because the AI is sampling a new action at every single frame. It's deciding what to do, right? So imagine you have a 50% probability of holding shield at each frame, and there's 60 frames per second. Uh, it's reevaluating if it should continually hold shield, right? And so if there's a 50% probability, there's a very high likelihood it'll drop the shield very soon. Now, we do have something called a drop counter to ensure a certain number of frames have passed since you let go to make sure it is, in fact, what you want to do. But still, with the 50% probability, there's a pretty high likelihood that you're going to drop the shield, right? So that's where this concept of conditional probability comes in handy, where the uh, probability of pressing shield is conditioned on the fact that you already are in the shield state, okay? Um, I'm going to revisit this concept of conditional probability a bit later, but I just want to show you what it looks like in action and how to apply it to our game. Um, actually, before I move on, does, does anyone have any questions on this? Oh, I see okay, Celtics cool. time typing, but uh, so far so good. Okay, so um, I'll let Celtics t time type while I load this bad boy up. So the first thing I'm going to show you guys is just a simple combo, okay? Uh, just wait for this thing to load. And it's the one I was describing to start, which is the uppercut into flip kick. Um, this is one of my personal favorite combos. Um, so I'm just going to show you guys how to do it. So uh, what it looks like, we'll just hop onto here. It's this into this, right? It's It's a really nice combo. You can like hit the opponent twice before they leave hit stun. Um, and I really enjoy doing it. Of course, when the opponent is high damage, then the first uppercut throws them like really high and you need to time it right to, to get the second one. Um, but we won't worry about the timing for now. Uh, we, we can touch that later if we have more time. Uh, but the important thing we want to show our AI is basically how to combo. Okay, so I'm going to turn data collection on. Then I'm going to do the uppercut and then into flip kick. I'm going to probably do it a few times just, just to show it. it. So we're showing it this specific combo. Now, if I hop into training config, um, I'm going to actually, I'll, I'll just show you one thing that probably won't work. And then I'll show you something that, that will work. Um, I haven't tested this, so maybe it might work. Who knows? But I doubt it. So I'm just going to train um, my model using movement as the focus area. And I'm intentionally showing you a bad uh, bad input or a bad feature to train on because I want to show you basically this concept of selecting the appropriate features. So I'm just going to train the model over here. 
going to move my guy right beside the opponent. Uh, and it's saying that the dominant thing to do is to do the uppercut. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, assume you already did the uppercut. What are, how do the probabilities change? And this isn't necessarily what we want to show it, right? Um, because what we want to do is as soon as it does the uppercut, we want to increase the probability of doing the flip kick, which is a high percentage to special. Now, let me show you how selecting the appropriate features can really make a big difference. So I'm going to scroll down to here, and I'm going to select action representation. I'm going to so explain to you guys what this is uh, afterwards, but I just want to show you something. I'm going to dial up the epochs, turn down these lambdas, and we will watch what's going to happen. Now you see the probability of special started to increase a lot. Did you just see what happened, guys? So if we're currently in the idle state, it has a very high probability of doing the uppercut. But as soon as I tell it we're in the uppercut state, now it increased the probability of doing the special by a lot more, right? So unclick this and click this. And I'm sure that if we increase the epochs even more, right, and we train the model, the dominant action would, in fact, become the flip kick in this specific state. And we do see that this happened. So now we taught our model uh, to basically conditionally do an action based on the current action it's doing, right? So when it's in idle, the dominant action is uppercut. As soon as I do an uppercut, now the dominant action becomes the flip kick, which is exactly what we showed it. And this is a key concept to understand in order to implement combos. Now, I'm going to explain what exactly um, action representation is, this concept of conditional probability, um, and I'm hoping that my tablet works as, as I walk through this. Um, so I'm just going to do a brief explanation, and then I'm going to pause for, for some questions, okay? So I'm going to go into here. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay. Let's get it. Let's get it. Okay. Fingers crossed that this works. Okay, so I think I explained before that the intention of what we're doing is to learn this thing, this pi thing. This stands for policy. Okay. Oh, so annoying when it accidentally selects it. So this stands for policy, and the policy is the mapping from states right, which is a snapshot of the environment, to actions, which is all these things that you're doing, right? So it's the probability of states, or sorry, it's the probability of actions given the state. Now, why am I saying this again? So I want you guys to imagine that the state is like this really long list of things, right? And you can imagine like each one of these squares is like uh, something in the list. Oops. Um, this is it doing that. Every time I do a dot, it does that. Okay. And you can imagine that this goes on until the end. We specifically have 115 of these features in the state. Um, and so what's happening is the AI is trying to look at all the features together to make a decision. Okay. Now, oftentimes, if you, prevent, if you present an AI with too many features at once, uh, some of those features might be correlated. Um, which means that they either move up together or they move down together. And it could be purely by accident. And what this ends up leading to um, is something that's called spurious correlation. So I'll, I'll give you guys an example. So what has happened to me in the past is that um, my AI was learning something like totally wrong. Because as, for example, as the match started, what I did is I ran towards my opponent, right? And in my head, I was thinking, okay, I'm running towards my opponent because my opponent is far away from me, right? Um, so in my mind, what I was doing is I was making that decision based on my distance to the opponent. But what also happened is as time progresses in the game, you increase your elemental gauge, right? It increases this naturally. And so this is what I mean by a positive correlation is that this was going up at the same time that the distance was going down. 
right? This is actually a, a negative correlation, but, but you guys know what I mean, is that they're moving in tandem with each other. And so from the AI's perspective, it saw two patterns. It, it saw that I was, move, I was moving to the right because my distance was far, as well as I was moving to the right when this was going up. And so what the AI decided to do is said, I'm going to pick one of these as the reason why you're moving to the right. And it ended up picking this one over here, that whenever the elemental gauge moves up, then you should move to the right. And that's obviously not what I wanted. Right? And so that's one of the really hard things to solve in machine learning when you have all these features that can potentially be correlated. Now, why the heck am I telling you guys this? Um, I'm telling you guys this because it's important to recognize that the AIs cannot read your mind. Right, all they do is look for patterns in the data, and they're gonna basically map those patterns to what they think is the reason why you made a decision, and then it's gonna say this pattern goes to this action. Right, so if you don't want that to happen, that's why we provide you with this concept of a focus area so you can specifically tell your AI what you want it to focus on. And in this case, I selected action representation because this specifically tells your AI the current state that you're in, right? The current action that you're doing, as well as the current action that the opponent is doing. So if I go back to this thing over here, where I have all these features, right? We have 115 of these features, right? What we're doing when we select action representation, I'll, I'll pick a different thing over here, is we're selecting a subset of these features and we're telling the AI, I want you to only focus on those for now, right? For this specific session, only focus on those, right? So for example, uh, let's say somewhere over here is like positioning, somewhere over here is like platforms, right? What we're saying is ignore this stuff for now, I just want you to focus on um, my current action. My current action, oops. And, as well as the opponent action. Oh man, I need to stop doing those dots for the eyes. That's what I want you to focus on, is the, my current action and the opponent's current action, right? And it takes into account the direction, the button they're pressing, whether they're in a vulnerable state or not. But that's what we're doing is we're saying, I want you to focus on this. And now, right, what we're saying is that this part of the state is heavily focused on this. Therefore, the probability of you taking a specific action is largely based on the state, which is comprised of your current action and your opponent's current action, which means that the AI is now going to consider the fact that we are in the uppercut state and to increase the probability of doing a flip kick, right? And if we don't do an uppercut and we're idle, now there's a higher probability of doing the uppercut. I rambled for a long time, but I just think it's really important to understand the concept of conditional probability because everything in this game, right, the action you take in every situation is conditioned on the situation, right? Um, Every situation is different, and there's a lot of little nuances to every sing single situation. Um, so yeah, and then the, the other big takeaway is that we are basically selecting a subset to focus our attention on, and that specific one for combos is called action representation. Okay, I'm going to pause now. I talked a lot. Uh, open it up to any questions. Yes, sir. From uh, Jeremy. He got a question saying that uh, he didn't realize that action representation was also focusing on the opponent's actions. And that's mm. telling him that the training action against a dummy might not be the best option unless mm. we create a loop with said dummy. That is a great, that is a great point. Um, so I've been actually debating this in my head recently, whether I want to separate out um, your like your action representation and the opponent's action representation. I think this might help people. Um, who knows? I, I might do that later today. Um, but yeah, for, for right now, it, it encompasses both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, that, that's I didn't a great know point that about the dummy though. Yeah, but good good thing we visited. It. And uh, Celtics time uh, revisiting on the concept on the uh, shield. You say that. Uh, 
does the model look into the shield remaining percentage, as in the shield counter, or does it not mm. know when to stop? Because for, mm. for the audience out there, there is a counter for the shield. So mm. once the shield is depleted, your model would get knocked out. So mm. That is an excellent question. Um, at the current moment, we do not. However, we certainly can do it in the future. Um, and this is one of the great things of doing these like tests is that people come up with these recommendations to include uh, going forward. Um, and I certainly think that is one that, that we will likely include is basically the shield counter, how much is remaining. Um, because I don't know if you guys know what happens when you hold the shield for too long, but it's it's not a good situation. Um, here, I, 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 can, I can actually show you guys what happens. Um, if you hold the shield for too long, you go into like a major stun. And you can't do anything for like, like almost like two to three seconds. So it's very easy to get hit at that point. Um, so it's certainly a, an excellent point to include the counter in the input because the AI is going to need that. Um, I think historically, we probably focus more on actions than defense. But certainly, we, we do want to make defense a big part of the gameplay going forward. So yeah, we can certainly include that. Um, probably not this week because it'll mess up with everyone's models. But uh, certainly for um, the Treasure Cup, after the qualifiers is done, we can include that. Got it. That's a really nice uh, info here. So, uh, so far, there's no extra question. So please resume. All righty. All righty. So, um, so the reason also why I, I showed... I'm just going to end this for a second to pause it. The reason also why I showed this this concept of conditional probability is because, uh, and I think I explained it at the beginning with, with the shield, um, is that you can use action representation to tell your AI that you're currently in the shield state, right? And that once you're in the shield state, increase the probability going forward that you will continue to hold the shield state, okay? Um, we can show uh, a brief example of this and then after i'll show you guys how to actually use it against a projectile um i know a lot of people have been asking me about that historically we actually had a bug in the projectile ray cast uh which was messing things up um but we fixed that and it's, it seems to be working now i did a few tests this morning um and then i'm also going to explain one concept of why it might not work as optimal uh as you guys want and um I, I can basically explain the data collection process and um some alternatives that, that we're considering there. So I'll retry the session over here. Um again I'll just turn data collection on and then I'll do like a bunch of random stuff. Um the intent for what I'm doing over here is I, I basically want to do like a bunch of random actions. It doesn't really matter in this case. Um just to show it that you're doing a bunch of stuff and there's a low, oh, I meant to press shield. And then there's a low probability of shield. And once you do press shield, there's a high probability of holding it, right? And then I'll do that again. And then once I do press shield, there's a high probability of holding it again. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll end training over here. Um, and I'll go into the training config. Again, we're going to want to go down to action representation. Um, and let's kind of see what happens. So if, if, if you see what I just did, I turned on shield and it increased the probability of holding shield a lot more, right? So I was just doing like a bunch of random actions. I guess it turned out that most of the actions were attack. So when you're in idle, basically, um, there's a certain probability of doing attack, jump, all this stuff. Um, but you see that um, the shield has a pretty decent probability because I did press shield once in a while. But it noticed that as soon as I did press press shield, once I was in the shield state, it increased the probability even more, right? And this is exactly what you want if you want to teach your AI how to hold the shield, is that it needs to understand the state that it's in, right? It needs to focus on the fact that its current state is that it's holding shield, right? And then once it holds shield, increase the probability even more of holding shield, 
right? Because otherwise you're going to get what a lot of people experience is these drops essentially where it starts to go into the shield state and then it drops out of it really quick. And that's not what you want. You want it to hold shield for a certain period of time. Um, so that is essentially the, the concept of combos applied to basically holding an action. And similarly, um, I don't think a lot of people do this, but you can apply the exact same concept to the headbutt. Right, because the headbutt is one of those moves that you're able to charge up. And I see um, most of the AIs don't actually charge it up. It's just a quick hit. But if you do hold it, it actually charges it up. Um, and it makes the eventual impact a lot stronger. Right, It deals more damage, more knockback. Um, and it's also very good for timing. For example, if you notice your opponent's coming to stage and they're not quite beside you, yet you can just hold it and then release it when they're within distance. So it's just another thing for you guys to consider. Um, okay, I'm going to pause for a second, um, see if anyone has any questions. Uh, if not, I can show you how to use this against an actual projectile. Yep, let's move on to the exciting actual example. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do it against the water special. Um, oh, actually, while I'm doing this, I'm going to show you guys the concept of an action recorder because this is pivotal and actually training your AI and how to do this stuff. Um, I don't think a lot of people know that we actually have this functionality. Um, so if you click on the opponent's um, image down here, you can actually switch and control the opponent. Right. So now I'm controlling the opponent. And then if you want to switch back, you can click on yours. Um, there's another way to do this as well on the keyboard. You can click tab to switch between the characters that you control. Um, on the uh, on a controller, you click the logo button. Um, but yeah, we certainly have this functionality that you can oscillate between the two uh, whenever you choose to. And the reason why this is important, it's important for multiple things. So, I mean, the first thing that it's great for is positioning uh, the opponent in specific places. So for example, here I put it at the top of the wall. So for example, maybe I want to teach my AI um, how to handle when someone's at the top of the wall. Um, Maybe you can also put it like on a ledge so that you can like specifically like teach it to do stuff like that when it's on the ledge. Um, it's extremely good for putting your AI in various situations. And going back to what I've been talking about this whole time is that every action is conditioned on the state that it's in. So you want to put your a your sorry you want to put the opponent in all these different types of states so that you can train what to do in every situation. And switching to the opponent is very important in, to basically position it wherever you want. The other thing that it's great for in terms of putting yourself in specific states is we have this thing called an action recorder. So it's the same button that you would press to uh, collect data. You press it, and now you're able to do actions, right? So here's like a very simple combo I did. And to stop the action recording, you press the data collection button again. And as soon as you switch to your fighter, now the opponent will start doing this on loop, right? And now you can actually train properly against certain attacks. Um, similarly, what you can do, so right now it loops it forever, but you can also have it to not loop, right? And now it'll just do it once. So it'll just do it once and then it'll go back into idle. And this is good for sort of like one-off situations. Um, I'm going to put something back on loop, though, because uh, I want it to continually do the water special. And we're specifically going to show you how to defend against the water special. So um, I'm going to turn action recorder on, and then I'm just going to press the special button over there. Um, and now what's going to happen is every time, it's just basically just going to keep pressing special. So whenever the power up comes, um, then it'll actually do it. So I'm going to turn on data collection. I'm just going to do like a bunch of random attacks until, there you go, the water special hit, and then I put on shield. Okay, and I'm just doing. Oh, the time's running out actually. Um, let's let's restart the session <laughs> so that we can get a few more reps in. So I'll just do the same thing. Um, I'll turn data recording on, press special, turn it off, and then I'll switch back, and then I'll start collecting a bunch of data. I'm just going to like. Like punch a bunch of times, doesn't really matter. But just to kind of show you the differentiation for when you're in a specific state. Okay, so that when you don't see a projectile, 
um, I'm doing one thing, but when I do see a projectile, I'm going to basically do the shield, which is a separate thing. So I'll do it like a few times over here, just to collect some data. And I'll do it once more. Um, and then once we go into the training config, I'll show you guys one one problem that that could arise with the current way we're collecting data and some of the methods that we're exploring. Okay, so I did that a few times. So I'm going to end data collection over here, hop into the training config. We're going to hop right over to advanced config again, focus. Uh, actually, we're not going to do action representation this time because I just want to show you the concept of identifying the projectiles and doing uh, shield. Of course, you don't have to do shield. You can do a jump as well. Um, but I'm just going to hop into there. So we're going to do the raycast projectile distance as well as the raycast projectile on target. Okay, I'm going to explain what these are. I'm just going to train first, though. I'll bump this up a little bit. And I'll train the model. Um, as you saw, there's going to be a big increase in the probability for attack. That's what we were doing, which is great. Okay. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in a projectile. Um, specifically, this was a water projectile, and it was coming from the opponent. Okay. And you can rotate the projectile around like this. This was traveling towards us. And you see that as the projectile approached, increase the probability of shield by a lot. And then as it goes away, it kind of decreases the probability of shield, right? And this is this is e exactly what, what we wanted. Um, now, you might be wondering, it looks like the probability of shield goes up a little too late. Like, what is that about, right? Uh, we certainly have taught it that once it detects that to increase the probability, right? So for example, if I just get rid of this, it's basically, very little increase to the probability of shield. But once we do, in fact, have a projectile um, and it approaches, and specifically, especially when it's turned towards you, um, now the probability is quite high. Um, the reason for that is because we actually don't um, we actually don't collect data at every single frame. Um, initially we did, <laughs> but people started complaining about, um, about the fact that it was taking too long to train because obviously if you collect more data, um, you are just, you're just increasing like the number of like, uh, instances it has to iterate over what, when, when training. Um, and to a large extent, it achieved something very simple, right? Where imagine you have an action that you repeat five times. Um, and yeah, it, it, like you basically have like a, an action that you repeat five times. If you can just um, train on that once, it should end up with something very similar. But what ends up happening is when you hold an action like shield and you start holding it here, right? Um, What's going to happen is like if we collect it every like for example 15 frames, it's going to start off here. The next time it sees it is going to be here. Then the next time is here. Then the next time is here, and it's not seeing all these like intermediate times where you saw um, the projectile moving towards you and you're pressing shield, right? So like imagine you look at like this like, like as a timeline, um, like you. <laughs> Your little guy's here, the opponent's over here, and it's doing like the water special, right? So it starts off here. Um, ideally, what you would want is at every single frame, like imagine all these little ticks are frames. You'd want to record data at every single frame because you're doing shield at all these frames, right? And that, but what happens is if you do it like every 10 frames or so, you miss all these in between. And now the next time you sample it is here, then the next time you sample it is here, which is why you see this almost like um, stepwise function of it like increasing all of a sudden, right? As opposed to something a little more continuous. Um, of course, this does go away the more time that you train. Um, oh, sorry, this should have been the opponents. 
the opponent's thing. Um, of course, it does go away the more time you train. It does become a little more continuous. But I just wanted to note that for you guys. Uh, it's because we actually sample the data on um, on some frequency, at some like n number of frames. Uh, additionally, we sample every time you change your action, right? Every time you do something slightly different, we're sampling the data. But because of the fact that shield, you're just holding it, you're not continually pressing it. Um, that's what that's what makes it get messed up essentially. Um, I hope this makes it. Nonetheless, it is still doing it, right? And if I save this and then I continue to stack on top of it, it will increase the probability of shield by a lot in this specific situation. Um, I'm going to pause for a second to see if anybody has any questions here. Yes, uh, I think this ties really nicely with a uh, second question coming from Jeremy. He asked sure. that, like, uh, what would be the difference in terms of, uh, you know, training data recorded when you are holding a button for one second versus and uh, just tapping an action? Because you mentioned uh -huh. there's a difference between there's a state change versus yeah. a holding it. So, like, uh, yeah. Maybe we can yep. uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah. So it, uh, 100%. So there, there is, in fact, like it's exactly what, what Malcolm said. If you're just holding a button, um, then the system doesn't consider that a state change. It only considers it a state change the first time you, you press the button, right? Um, when you're holding it, nothing else will get recorded until such a time. Uh, that you either let go or press it again, or until a certain number of frames have passed. So for example, if our sample period uh, is every 10 frames, then what we're going to do is we're going to listen for each 10 frames that have passed, and then we're going to uh, sample that state action pair. Um, of course, if you change your action, we're sampling that every single time. But for cases where you have to hold it, uh, we're actually not sampling that every single frame. Um, so. Yeah, so that, that basically gets sampled after like a certain frequency or a certain number of frames have passed. Um, with that said, we are experimenting with a ton of different data collection methods. That's just the one we ended up going with um, because like I mentioned, people kept complaining about the long time to training. Um, I, th I think a lot of people have a misconception on machine learning training uh, as if they expect it to happen instantly. Um, it is, a, it is the case that the more data you have, the longer it takes to train. There, there's simply no way of getting around that, right? Um, but if you're not familiar with machine learning, you're, you just like play this game, you train with a lot of data, and you're like, this fucking sucks, right? Like uh, it's taking like an hour to train, but you don't realize you collected 10,000 like data points. Of course, it's going to take long to train, right? Um, and so we just... <laughs> kind of remove that headache um, by basically doing a lot of the filtering for the people. Um, of course, it does come with some drawbacks, and we're continuing to do research on the best methods for, for data collection, um, but that's ultimately why we decided on, on this specific decision. Yeah, and maybe that could be another optionality in the future for the perfectionist player that allow them to collect every frame, like to tailor make their data collections. Yeah, I think we certainly can offer it. Um, we will likely have to put a warning because, uh, yeah, I, I mean, like, I, I know people will complain because even I've mentioned it to people before that it takes longer and they still complain. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's just one of those things. I get it. I get it. Uh, I see. And uh, since we are on the any, any other questions? topic, yes, with you, a couple a really quality one. Jerry me also asked that the difference between small, medium, and large projectiles and the respective purpose. No questions? No, no, no. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Brandon? Um, Brandon, I think no we're... Questions. Hey, Brandon. Sorry? Can yeah. you... Malcolm is speaking, but it seems like you can't hear him. Ah, uh, damn. I cannot hear him. Okay, oh. one second. This happens periodically to me where I, I can't hear people anymore. Uh, so you can hear me. So M Malcolm, do you want to uh, jump back on? Just log yeah. out and log on and see if it fixes it? Yes, sir. Um, I okay. hope it does. Okay. It usually happens when like, I have to log out and log back on. Uh, yeah, it's okay. You can stay on. I think okay. it's a uh, Malcolm issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Celtics time is uh, reporting that he can't 
hear Malcolm either. Uh, but I'll fill in. So Jeremy has a follow up question. He's asking so, what is Jeremy the difference. Has a question. He he's asking what's the difference between small, medium, and large projectiles. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so the the short answer is, um, huh. we we were considering multiple different types of projectiles per fighter. Um, the we, we ultimately we just haven't got around to it. There's a lot of things that we're trying to implement. Uh, I I might honestly remove this. Um, and also the large projectile needs to be a lot larger. Um, but yeah, I, I might ultimately remove this, maybe just do like water, fire, electric, but at the intent is basically cause we in, intended to have multiple different types of projectiles at, at different sizes. So like a smaller one that you can shoot off more frequently, stuff like that. We, we might still revisit that, but that, that was essentially the intent when we were building this out. Yeah. I... Am I back? I can hear you. <laughs> Brandon, this is, can you hear, this can you is hear Max. Me? I cannot. I cannot. Oh, oh my god! I'm in sanctioned. So I'm in sanctioned. Yeah. J uh, <laughs> it, <happens laughs> way, we're, we're at, it feels like we're having a three-way call, but only two of the three people can hear each other. Yeah, <laughs> you're the middleman. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> Great. Can can you erase this Celtics uh, oh, time man. question? Um, I, I think that's a really are, are brilliant. Th are there question. any more questions? Uh, yeah. One second. Brandon, did you mute? Did did you happen to mute Malcolm by any chance? I don't think so, because um, I was able to hear him prior to this, and I and I didn't really go back to the Discord screen. The question um, is, yeah. Let me know if there's there's any other questions. This is pretty much all the material I I wanted to cover. Um, of course, I can get into more math, but I'll try not to bore people over here. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, I think Malcolm was trying to mention one other question. Malcolm, w w were were you looking to mention the one from Jeremy? No, from Celtics time. Okay. Uh, which one is it? Let me let me read it so Brandon can uh, can can hear me. I can ping you here. Sorry, <laughs> you know what this reminds me of? Like those movies where it's like someone can see like the ghost, but the other person can't. Yeah, exactly. So they're like, <laughs> Ooh, they're like the ghost. The ghost is empty. Uh, oh, okay, there there is one question from Celtics time. I'm just trying to figure out specifically what uh, he is asking. So. Celtics Time says, will picking multiple focus points lower the average weight for focused points, or will it lower the non-focus point average weight? Uh, he, gave, uh, he gave an example. He said, my position, 0 0.25 weight. Opponent's position, 0 0.25 weight. Current actions, 0 0.5 weight. If I focus on the opponent's position as well, will I have? Will that basically like net itself out? Um, it's a very can you, detailed question. Um, can you here's a difference. repeat the, 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 the weights again? Because like the I think first I example the it gave you, it, re, it, it zero out the non-focused one, a, and the second one. Huh. One, one second. Question. Yeah, uh, he, he rephrased it. He said, uh, a simpler way to ask the question is, what is the impact of having multiple focused areas, I guess, selected compared to only one? Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, there's a lot to unpack here, but... Um... <laughs> okay, so... Let us let us start in one case, the extreme case, right, where we are using all features. Okay, um, when we are using all features, then each one has basically, um, without looking at the data, each feature should have 
sort of like an equal probability of contributing to the output. Right? If we don't look at the data, we don't know anything about the neural network. Um, let's say we have 100 features. And, but what, let's say we only wanted to focus on 90 of those features, right? So there's 10 features we say we don't really care about. Um, what, but what happens is like, okay, now we're focusing on these 90, right? Um, we don't really care about the, the other ones. Um, all of the weights do get impacted, right? But we impact the weights in a way to say, I don't really want to focus on these 10. I want to focus on these 90. Okay. Now remember this concept um, of uh, spurious correlation that I mentioned, right? When you have 100 weights, uh, it is more likely to happen than if you have 90. Uh, sorry, if you have 100 features, it's more likely to happen than if you have 90 features. Okay. Now, if you have 50 features, uh, it is less likely to happen than 90 features, right? And the smaller number of features you go, the less likely for spurious correlation to the point where if you're only looking at one feature, it's impossible to have spurious correlation because there is no two features, right? You can't compare that one feature to another. Um, so the first thing to note is as you decrease the number of features, it reduces the probability for spurious correlation. Um, now, what that means is that most of the focus for, um, or you can think of most of the weight, most of the weight in the network will be going towards the fe features that you focus on, right? Um, because as you increase the number of, of features, um, you're spreading that across more features which ultimately means there's a higher probability of spurious correlation because a lot of these things can kind of like interact with each other. Um, so it, it, essentially what's happening is as you shrink the number, you're putting more focus on those specific weights. Um, now, to your specific question of like, you, you have like, a, a, like, let's say, I think you had like three features, for example, and you're saying... Um, if I focus on two versus three, or, or one versus two, one of the two, um, yes, it will kind of spread out um, the um, the weight, or not the weight, the weight's a bad word. It will spread out all that importance, right, on multiple features more. It doesn't necessarily do that. But it has the potential to do that. And the reason I say it doesn't necessarily do that is because it could be the case that you're using a feature which doesn't really impact the model at all. And so in the learning process, it actually won't put much importance on that specific feature. However, it could, right? If you actually use that feature, then it could put some more importance on that specific feature. Um, sorry, I know I was rambling for a bit. Um, I don't know if I answered the, the question, but I'll just try and quickly, quickly summarize that the less features you have, the more concentrated the, the focus is and the more quote unquote importance is placed on those specific features. Um, it does, as you increase the features, it does increase the potential to put more importance on different features, but it doesn't necessarily, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I'll just leave it at that because I was, I was rambling for a bit and I was trying not to use the math for two reasons. One is proprietary, um, uh, but but the the other reason is just because it's it's just a lot. <laughs> Got it. A am I back? Yes, you're back. I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the the spirit of Celtics time question is trying to hack the system by selecting the say that we have a hundred features, we select ninety nine of it. That will negatively select almost like void out one feature that he doesn't like to focus just a theoretical yes. uh, approach on his part oh yes yes that that is certainly the case that the features that you don't select um they they get placed very little importance in the decision making process mhm mm mm -hmm. so and, it's and, sorry well, well one thing I'll note is that if you don't select anything it automatically selects everything so you just want to note that. And th that's the case with most things, is that if you don't select anything, it just automatically uses everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I say for his question, he only need to select like one. That almost like achieved what he wanted, which is like voiding everything else. Yeah, it, exactly, exactly. W w which is why w w when I showed certain examples of um, 
when I was like, okay, I only care about the raycast, um, like the raycast distance uh, for the sp for the projectile and the raycast, whether it's on target or not for the projectile. What I'm saying is, I don't want you to place importance on any of these other features. I only want you to focus on these, right? Now, of course, is still some importance placed on the other ones if they happen to be very important in the d decision making process but it gets outweighed by these ones that you select like this is going to be the dominant um, decision maker in in the process got it yeah. jeremy asked a question what's the purpose of focusing on weight oh this one yeah, I don't think many people use it, but it is actually important. Um, but this is a more nuanced strategy. So it, like, you can imagine the two extremes, right? Where you have a very heavy fighter and a very light fighter. Um, and let's say your fighter is in the middle. Your fighter's in the middle. And so the way that you would handle a heavy fighter is quite different than the way that you would handle a light fighter. So, for example, a heavy fighter can clearly, like, trade blows with you, like, no problem, right? And and they will end up winning if that's what you're doing is just trading blows because they ultimately deal more damage. They, they will send you farther back, and they have a higher probability of knocking you out earlier. Um, so you probably don't want to play that game with them. A light fighter, on the other hand, like, if a fighter is lighter than you, then you probably do want to play that game with them, right, where you know you can overpower them. But for a heavy fighter, maybe you want to use the fact that you're lighter and you're more agile to move around them. Maybe you want to bait them more, right? And so that's why you can use the weight difference. Um, and it'll basically detect the discrepancy between your weight and your opponent's weight. And you can basically do like a, a custom training for that. Now, with that said, I don't think that we actually provide the ability to select the weight in here, and we should. Um, so that is a good reminder for, for me to put that in here for us to be able to toggle the opponent's weight. Um, thank you for that. But yeah, that's essentially the intent is that you want to train differently depending on the weight of your opponent. And I think that covered everyone's question for this session. Cool. Um, we can end it off over here then, guys. This is basically all I wanted to cover. I think those were some, some excellent questions. Um, and yeah, let's, let's end it up early. And of course, if you guys have more questions, you can always put it in the chat. Um, and I'll, I'll certainly check the, I check the chat frequently, so I'll certainly answer any questions in there. Um, and if I don't, just you, you can tag me, but don't do it very frequently, please, because <laughs> I still have a lot of development to do. But if it's something very important and you feel the need to tag me, then, then you can go for it. Awesome, right. awesome. Sweet. With that, guys, I will stop sharing my screen and I can end it off over here. All right.